My name is Darwin Sonoy, and I'm the subject matter expert and uh, courseware designer and trainer at uh, CSIWindows.com. How many of you have been to the website? Anyone recognize the website? Okay, good, a respectable amount. Not yet, <laughs> you got the card, you got the pitch from me at the booth, great. Um, CSIWindows.com is about making you the expert in application provisioning. Uh, the concept is to make sure that you can deliver apps, whatever your employer throws at you in the future. Uh, win 8, Win 9, whatever comes down the pike, we want you to be able to resolve the problems. And we want you to have the skills and, and the tools to do that. We do live online training, and in November and December, we're going to be doing our first uh, European time zone training. It's going to be at 10 o'clock GMT, so you can translate that uh, to whatever your time zone is. Uh, we also have, next week I'm training at PDS, our um, application provisioning engineer course. We have one seat left in that class if you want to try to sneak into it. I have courseware for one, one extra seat. Okay, um, what we're trying to do uh, at CSIWindows.com with this training, oops, let's go back, is we want to make you an expert at these type of technologies. So typically, an XP era packager who has been packaging apps hardcore on XP, if you get the registry keys down in the right place and the files in the right place, then you have done your job well, you're a hero for your employer. However, uh, since Win 7, it's kind of like the proverbial Dutch boy pulling his finger out of the dam. We've had an entire flood of technologies that really aren't uh, what the app was designed to run on. So we have all of these technologies and many more. Uh, the, the app, I just put app V up there, but all flavors of app virtualization. This is a shift in the runtime environment that the app was not necessarily and probably was not developed for by the developer. We have very few developers trying to embrace all of these runtime technologies and make sure their app works there for you so you have to do nothing when you get it. So because of that, if you start to learn these technologies of how apps run, how to analyze them with Procmon, either during the install, if the install is not getting captured right, or during the runtime, if it runs fine on Win 7 but not on 64-bit, or it runs fine on Win 7 64-bit but not under virtualization, how do you get to the core of it? You might have some big cool tools like AppDNA, ChangeBase, or InstallShield that are helping you with this, but every once in a while they'll kick out an app and say it's fixed, and it's not. Or every once in a while, they'll say, this, this app cannot be resolved. It's, a, you know, it's junk. Uh, and your, but your manager comes to you and says, it's going to cost $500,000 to upgrade that. Do you think you might want to give it a go? I want you to be able to say, yes, I want to give it a go, because I've got the, the, the wherewithal, both in terms of tools and training. The, tr the tools we use are all free tools like Procmon, APIMon. Um, we teach you how Windows apps work, how they load code. But we have a a concept that's really important. When you hear these terms, you might be thinking, I'm not an app developer, I don't want to learn that stuff. We do something that I, that I call concept trenching. And this means that we teach you enough about something, but not too much. For instance, I can teach you about how processes work on Windows. If I go off on half a day about how the time slicing system works in order to draw, divide time up between apps, I'm doing a disservice because there's a 95% chance that will never be the cause of an application problem in your environment. So I don't teach it. I teach you the parts of how a process works on Windows that will cause the majority of problems. So you need, it, you need to know it deep enough, but not too deep. We're not trying to make you into systems programmers. We're trying to make you solve more problems at work so that you're gold for your employer. That's the concept. Let's get into the technical content. How many of you have seen some Win 8 demos, gone to some Win 8 stuff, Microsoft stuff, that kind of stuff? How many of you currently, your, your company says, we're supporting Win 8 apps starting the end of the week? Okay, we got one. How many of you think that within 18 months, no matter what your management's saying, you're going to be supporting apps on Windows 8? We all know that, you know, oh, well, we're not supporting that platform yet. Then R&D says, we got to have tablets, and we're going to run Win 8. And now you are, and that's the end of it. Or sales says, we got to have these glitzy sales apps so we can sell more. Uh, and now you're supporting it. <laughs> so you're going you're gonna to hit this. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the programming model. Um, the thing that's the, the closest to the Win 8 programming model is .NET. How many of you remember when .NET came on the scene? It's showing my age. 
Uh, .NET's about, what, 10, 12 years old. When it came on the scene, it added a new layer on top of Windows, which was a programmer's runtime environment that made it easy for them to code apps. WinRT, same thing. The difference is, under .NET, I always have to have a full-blown version of Windows. Under WinRT, I can have a mobile variant of Windows, which is very different from the full full-on Windows. So WinRT is the abstraction layer that not only abstracts the whole programming model, but it abstracts our device differences. So for admins, though, the, the main thing you need to know is that it's, it's on this runtime environment, which means a lot of new operational logs are available for when apps fail. And the, but the main thing you generally want to start focusing on is the deployment model. How do we deploy these uh, packages? So that's what WinRT is. Microsoft's gotten really mixed up on all their terminology. They started using Metro, and now there's supposedly some lawsuit regarding the term. So now what I use on my blogs so that it will, so when you're searching for it, you'll find it, is Windows 8 Metro WinRT apps. So that uh, I catch it all, and when you do a search for it, you'll find the stuff. It's crazy, but Microsoft always changes the terminology like three days before release, and then all the DLLs are still named the old name. And, one of the things about the programming model is it's a new variant of COM. Uh, for those of you who don't think you know anything about COM, you do. Anytime you've registered a DLL, anytime you've gone into H key classes root, anytime you've gone into a register key called CLSID, you are playing with COM. The first versions of COM are kind of broken because they only allow one COM registration to point to one file on disk. So this is a modified version that is um, uh, not, uh, it's not, dependent on the old com, com plumbing. So when you start to see some similarities, if you're doing traces on the app, uh, you're gonna want to, um, you're gonna want to keep in mind it's been improved, it's not such a pain as it is in uh, Win32 apps. Um, there are no dependencies on .NET when leveraging the pure JavaScript environment, although there can be, uh, developers can use some modified stripped down .NET in C Sharp, obviously, when they develop uh, C Sharp, uh, back here on the models, they, the main options are C. I don't need to point C plus plus or or uh, C Sharp, and then XAML is your uh, <coughs> um, graphical user environment, and then over here JavaScript uh, running on top of HTML or under HTML and CSS for your uh, graphical environment. I'm going to be speed talking. Uh, back last year, my session was an hour, and I sped talk through it. So guess what? It's a half hour this year. So you might have to get the video and slow it down to half time to actually understand what I'm saying. Um, Windows 8 apps. Uh, they're, you, you, also, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Windows 8, when you do the full-on operating system, is still Windows 7 under the covers. So it supports your apps full regular. I wish Microsoft had not turned off the start menu because this would be a much more evident fact that Win8 is not purely a mobile uh, OS. Installations are moving to user profile isolated, uh, also called per user, but per user is a bad name because in application deployment we have a million meanings for the term per user. So user profile isolated, the software gets installed into the user's profile. It is the going forward approach that's coming on. So although we've fought that in packaging and IT, it's like install everything for the machine so I can see it, patch it, find it, inventory it. It's moving away from that. It's moving towards we're going to support uh, user isolated prof, uh, installs. So you're going to have to get used to this and uh, account for it. I'm sorry? OK. Yep. So we're moving that way. Uh, another thing about uh, Win8 Metro WinRT apps is that they um, are very consumer Win8 story, store oriented. So Microsoft really focused on that to get the platform out. They're backstorying the, the, uh, the uh, admin story. How do we do this in the enterprise? Some parts of it look reasonable. Other parts aren't so uh, solid. Uh, very simplified app integration in terms of where do all the bits of the app live. They basically all live in one folder. However, as we go through the session, you'll see that, that there is some variations on that. Um, the, uh, I use the state data, so settings of the app or any temp files it generates, like indexes that it needs on an ongoing basis, are going to be in that folder uh, in the user profile. And then we have the actual application files are also isolated to the user. Now, under... Um, Windows 8, uh, we have per machine 
installs. It's called provisioning. So a per machine install is called provisioning. You want to add a provisioned package. When you do this, you are not really installing it per machine like you do with MSI. Instead, what you're doing is staging it for an install on demand when the user logs in. Who's familiar with the old active uh, install? Uh, you, put a, you put in, okay, this is the same thing, only it's for Win8. You basically stage the app and say, every user who logs in should have this list of apps, and if they don't, please propagate it to them. That's what a provisioned install is. There's a special service for acquisition of apps off of the store. It runs in the background. When you fire up the store app, it communicates to the service, and the service communicates to Microsoft's website. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, MSI Exec does the user install. So if I, as a user, visit the store and install an app, if I do a procmon trace on that, I'll find that MSI Exec actually moves the files into their location. If you turn on uh, verbose logging in MSI Exec, you will see nothing. If you turn on debug logging in MSI Exec, if you know how to do that, you will see nothing. So I've got a blog article that says the yeah, MSI Exec is secretly installing your AppX packages because it doesn't tell you anywhere if you turn on logs on MSI. Uh, an AppX, which is the new packaging format, is just a zip file. So you can actually rename it zip and open it in your favorite zip editor and see the contents. Within that is an AppX manifest.xml file that tells where everything's gonna go. Anybody play with Joomla? Few? Okay, this is a very similar uh, actual installation design to Joomla. Uh, when you get a Joomla file uploaded, it, it's got an XML in there, it tells where everything goes, and it's just a zip file. So it's very similar to that. Um, all packages must be signed. So if you haven't been getting into code signing yet, this is going to be yet another reason that code signing is absolutely essential. You can't even deploy an app unless it's signed. The state data, by default, if a developer says, I want to save some settings, that state data, by default, is going to go into files so that when we wipe out that app, it's a clean uninstall. Big plus for clean uninstalls and for per-user-based installs. However, a minus for corporate manageability. So if you want to manage an app settings, uh, most of them are not going to be in the registry. Some developers might go ahead and code uh, to the registry where you will have uh, the ability to manage that more directly, uh, but by default, uh, they may not be in the registry. Um, so this makes them less manageable via the network with things such as group policy. Let's talk about the story on line of business applications. So, with Win8, if I say I'm going to install a Win8 app, then the whole default is I'm going to the Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows App Store and installing an app. That's what that means. If you're going to do this weird thing like load apps in a corporate environment, you know, like if you're going to preload a machine or send apps, you know, this is kind of weird because really the Windows Store is the only place you're supposed to get apps. This is called line of business apps or LOB. So anytime you see that in MSDN or any Microsoft speak, line of business means how you normally are used to loading apps, and everything else would be off the Windows Store. The terminology applied to you doing one of those installs is called sideloading, because once again, you're avoiding the store. Shame on you. So you're sideloading your app when you load a corporate deployed AppX app. Um, I found conflicting information, and I haven't had time yet to test it, whether you can get apps from the store and sideload them. Uh, there's no official way as far as I know, but of course I'm going to be pounding on it to see if I, when, when it's downloading the app, if I can get the source and sideload it. And if you sign up for my uh, blog, uh, when I find that information, I will propagate it to you. Okay, enabling sideloading. So you're like, okay, we need to install some AppX apps that someone made here, some Metro apps and AppX packages. Just uh, uh, side note, the development environment for the developers is very lock, stock, and barrel. So in the past, the integration of the install stuff in Visual Studio, what it cranks out was almost summarily unusable all the time. With Visual Studio, when they make an AppX package and they publish it, even to test their own app, they have to sign it, publish it, and install it using the AppX install framework. So they will have to sign it. And it will be, one of the cool things is that package is probably 99%, unless something's messed up with your actual deployment target, going to work. So they put, in a way, they're kind of putting the developers through the gears of 
If you even want to run your own app just to check it out, you have to actually, under the covers, install uh, uh, Visual Studio is doing everything that they would have to do manually. So for side loading and corporate, first of all, you have to have the AppX package signed. Um, you, won't need, you won't need to sign it with a store cert, but you'll have to sign it with some sort of cert. Um, by default, uh, the developer environment will have a, a, a cert, uh, a store app uh, certification. You have to install that certificate on all of your machines if it's not part of the existing trusted routes. So if it's not a VeriSign code signing, uh, if you've made your own code, authentic code certificate, you're gonna have to make sure that that is trusted by all the browsers in your environment. If you have a corporate machine, it first of all has to be domain joined. So it can't, if you have corporate machines that are not domain joined, they can't use this first scenario. Then you have to go into group policy and enable allow all trusted applications to install. And then you can sideload an app that has the certificate trusted that it's signed with. So that, that's what you do for domain joined computers, the first two red bullets. This third one, um, for non-corporate machines, so if you're allowing bring your own device and people have a home machine, or um, you have machines that aren't domain joined for some reason, you have to get a side-loading product activation key. It's kind of like activating Windows. And if you are a Microsoft volume licensing customer or have any kind of agreement where you get activation keys, this will be really simple. Go up to the website and request one. Um, if you don't have that agreement in place, I'm, I haven't figured out yet what the steps are. If I'm just you know small company with 20 computers and I want to do it that way, how do I get that certificate? But otherwise, you can't install them. It's one of these two methods or nothing, so it's very controlled compared to setup exe MSI world. Uh, here's the group policy and the registry key that that group policy boils down to. Um, our per user installs are installing for the current user. There's a bunch of commands we can use for that. Uh, the commands for installing, you have two choices. Dism, which is the uh, tool for installing apps into a, an image if you're preparing a machine, but you can also use it interactively on existing machines. It's just very slow. And then there are PowerShell commandlets. Those are the only two ways to get apps, uh, AppX apps installed. There are per machine apps, which I told you already are staged to be done for a per user install upon login. And there are system apps that are pre-installed by Microsoft. And um, I haven't figured out yet if you can actually even do this yourself, but there is some apps that are installed, the special folders that, are, that Microsoft has put on there. Uh, you can use the DISM or the PowerShell commandlets. The DISM only does the um, per machine install uh, of the app, where the PowerShell commandlets can do per machine or per user, but you have to be installing for the user that's currently logged in. So this is probably not the way you're gonna do it. You're probably always gonna be doing provisioned apps because you're installing with a background account. Uh, where do the apps go? For provisioned apps, they're copied to program files, Windows apps. The Windows apps folder you don't have access to. If you try to list what's in there, it'll tell you access denied and it's pretty locked down. But every subfolder, you and regular users can read and execute what's in there. It's just that the folder names have this long kind of strong name of a Windows 8 app, and unless you start doing some logging, you usually can't determine what that folder name is easily. So it keeps users out from browsing in there and trying to play with stuff. But it also kind of keeps you out, so you have to know the full path, and then you can click the full path and get into that folder if you need to. And if you wanted to, you could start changing the permissions on that folder, but it might expose you to users doing some hacking too. If you install per user, oh, and that's done by Dism APIs, even if you use the commandlets to run, if you, if you proc on it, you'll see it's using a uh, dissim uh, uh, service in the background. When you do the per user install, whether the user logs in and gets the app deployed to them or you deploy it with an AppX uh, commandlet in PowerShell, it's gonna run MSI exec to place the final files in local app data packages full name. And that there's an example of what that would translate to for the user John down here. I don't have an example full app name, uh, they're, they're pretty long. So that's where the files will go, and you can, in that case, browse, browse the package's root. Here are some sample commands. I kind of crammed them on, but you'll have them in your, your slide downloads when I upload those. This is a dissim command for deploying online, adding a provision package so that it'll install for everyone. Skip license is important here. It's also doing a dependency path. So there are built-in dependencies. When a developer generates an app, if they have a dependency, 
AppX package, that will be in a, a dependencies subfolder. So make sure they give that to you if um, you're getting an app developed internally. And that's how you would deploy it automatically with the initial app install. Otherwise, you get this message, sorry, such and such dependency does not exist. Um, we also have uh, this dissim command line, remove a provision package. We have the, these are uh, PowerShell commandlets. It's not obvious by the uh, screen here, but it's a PowerShell commandlet. And then um, for current user only, we have uh, PowerShell commandlets as well. Removing a package might be more common. So you, you've installed it provision, but then for a given user, you want to uninstall it. Maybe it's giving you problems or something. You might uninstall it from one user. Uh, the app state and settings are saved as files. Developers use APIs. I guess we covered this already. Um, and then I, my suspicion is that some developers are going to go, I don't like it not being in the registry and spend some time hacking out a registry capability, which may be a blessing to you or it may not, depending on what happens with the app. So remember with all of this stuff Microsoft publishes about how a Win8 app should be built, developers immediately go, oh, you know what, I don't like it that way. I want to do it the old way I did it, or I want to do it this cool way, or I've got to have such and such. It's not supported by the WinRT environment. And before you know it, you get these apps that are a real blend of what was intended. So you always have to keep your eye out for that. Those are the ones that cause you three days of packaging when you're expecting a, a half hour. Uh, there's a bunch of new event logs. This, this actually isn't exhaustive. I've got a blog post that I'm under construction that's going to be very exhaustive about all of these. But there's a whole bunch of event logs and a whole bunch of text logs. I've also discovered just recently there's another text log. Um, so these are some of the places you start going to track down. There's two basic types of problems, deployment problems and runtime problems. And so um, those are the kind of things you look for in these logs. Uh, I, will, I will also have as part of that post an event log a custom view that when you download that and install it in event viewer, it consolidates all the known app X log logs into one view. So you can see them all at one go instead of spread across about 10 of them, I think. Okay, so that's the main uh, Win8 stuff. I just want to give you a little bit of background about um, CSI Windows. One of the things we include with all of our training is our portable application toolkit. We're also doing a drawing for 10 copies of it. It is a menu system that runs portably, which means that the apps that are in there do not need to be installed before you run them. Uh, it's based on the portable application framework. Portable application framework adds a lot of cool stuff so that you can run your your apps without installing them. However, it's very flash drive oriented. So it wants to save its state back to the flash drive. It doesn't elevate under any circumstances. And so I've had to do a lot of additional configuration to get it to run like an admin would want. Run my toolkit off the network in a VM on the server farm on a live machine. Run the tools I need elevated already. If I'm running under app v, automatically adapt to that. And any commands that are app v sensitive in that tool menu, make sure that's adapted to. So this is a part of uh, all of our training. Uh, so I've had to adapt it so that it does uh, the kind of things that you as admins generally expect, uh, we would expect it to do. You'd expect it to run off the network. You'd expect it to work with OTS elevation. Um, you'd expect it to be app v aware to run over RDS if, you, if you're doing it remotely over RDS. One of the cool things is if you're running on a regular, regular user session, OTS elevation is when you type in alternate credentials. So if you trigger this off and you're running on a regular user session, it'll prompt for alternate credentials. You key them in, and now the whole menu is running under that user. So now you can run a procmon on a regular user right there dynamically. You can start a procmon and then tell the user, hey, run through whatever made the error happen. Grab the log. Uh, we just published our ebook and e-class. This is our, actually our 64-bit um, course day. We have in our uh, ENG55 course, we have a 64-bit course day, and we've converted it to an ebook and a self-taught lab um, uh, environment. Uh, very good value. We're also going to be uh, raffling off um, 30 of these. Uh, extras, if you visit that URL out there, windows, csiwindows.com slash PE201, uh, complete the form and confirm in email. So you're going to be signing up for some mailing lists, but I'm a techie guy. I was telling someone I sent out the first pure marketing email in my whole three years of CSI Windows. I sent that out 
two months ago for the ebook. Otherwise, it's blog articles, hardcore tech blog articles that come out at the most once a week, and if I don't post anything that week, you don't get a newsletter. Um, and you can, un you can uh, unconfirm on any email you want. Immediately, you'll receive a 64-bit scripting toolkit, uh, which I'll be talking about uh, tomorrow. You'll also receive our uh, engineering checklist in our training. Uh, I know that when you guys go to training, because I, when I've been in training, you're sitting there constantly thinking about, okay, I gotta remember that, I gotta talk to the team about that, oh, this thing over here, and you're trying to keep notes, highlight, uh, put stickers on your paper so you can remember all these issues you need to talk to the team about, right? So I thought, well, you know, I already know all that stuff because I made the course. Why don't I just put it in a document that's at the end of the course? And then that way, you can relax, learn as much as you can. But when it comes time for team conversations, you just pick up that sheet and walk right through it. And it gives you the best practice as well as um, the rationale behind the best practice so that you can figure out, you know what, that doesn't apply to us. Or we're going to do it differently because now I understand why that best practice recommendation was, was made. Uh, you'll get that. Um, also, 30 drawings for the ebook, 10 for the portable toolkit, and we'll do five drawings for 500 off of CSI Windows uh, training. I'm running two training sessions on European time zones in November and December. So I already, told, yeah, I already told, mentioned that, didn't I? So it's ENG55, uh, which is our application provisioning engineer, and ENG70, which is our AppV sequencing engineer. You can find more information on the website about that. And all the drawings will be completed by October 20th. So make sure to go up there, confirm your email, so I have you in the system, so when we do the drawings, uh, you're set and ready to go. Session code for this session is T41. Wow, did it, 30 minutes. T41, please fill out your session evaluations. It's very helpful um, for the speakers, for the conference. Uh, you get to potentially get a goodie um, sent to you. Um, also, they told me that you need to deposit it in the box. Um, it, you, can't, you can't take your session eval from this session and drop it in another box in another session at the end of the day or something like that. So they really want them in as you walk out the door. Um, any questions? Yes, just be careful when you say self-sign that the certificate you're using if it's completely self-signed certificate that you're managing the expiry date properly, or uh, you can also just buy an Authenticode certificate without, uh, you can get, um, oh, I got a couple, a couple options, cheap options if you want to buy a public one. Yeah, but there's one that'll do 100 a year, which is pretty cheap, I've found, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I've got a, I've got a booth out on the trade floor, so if you want to catch up with me, ask any questions, talk about it's hard to get across what we're trying to do in our training. So if you, need, if, you, what, if you didn't quite get what I was talking about when I was talking about the training, please come over because I really want you to be able to invest in yourself so that your boss thinks you're the coolest uh, person on the planet when it comes to prov provisioning applications. Thanks a lot. <laughs>